I'm delighted there's four of us. <laughs> I think someone said to me, well, I'm coming to, the, to your bit. I went, oh, that's two of us then, that's good news. <laughs> so, can we get started? Good. Everyone meet Anthony. Anthony has to make sure we record correctly. And video. And if I move around too much. So if he smiles at us, or smiles, actually if you smile at me or wave your head, if I move around too much, let me know when you're at the start. Wave. You'll Go wave. Cool. Well, morning. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Ian Banner, most of you will know. The reason I'm here talking today is not because um, of my job in product design, where I head up the sales and service side of product design, which is very exciting. I'm here because another thing I do is uh, work on the Be Brilliant skill set uh, on behalf of operations, and I'm uh, the curator. Uh, if you imagine that term from the museum industry, the curator of your digital future, which is what this, uh, this uh, conference is all about. That means I organised and helped write the content that's in the Your Digital Future track that you can get on the Learning Zone websites. Um, and I am also now going to create Our DNA, which is uh, another of the tracks for next year for employees and um, consultants who work with us. So I'm here because of that. Uh, I wasn't the only person who worked on it. Uh, Peter Noble and a few others worked on the first of the tracks, but um, uh, uh, other people will work on it. The job of the curator is to make sure everything is put together rather than writes everything themselves. And I'm certainly not the only expert. In fact, I'm probably not the expert in this matter either. But as I'll say later, one of the things our future holds for us is experts are going to be a difficult thing to understand as we go ahead. Um, we're in the middle of the third real big revolution. The first revolution was the agrarian revolution where we worked out how to sort of uh, mass produce food and the population of this planet started to move up. The next one was the industrial revolution where we moved into conurbations. Both of those were localized. This is the third big revolution, the digital revolution. The power of what used to be uh, take a room 25 years ago in computing power is now in your hand. In 25 years time, the computing power in your hand will be the size of a blood cell. Honestly, we have no idea what that will mean to us, to our children, how they work. So what we have to be is adaptive about understanding how we move and change. And that's one of the things I'll go through. So uh, the talk title, PC, no signal. <laughs> oh, it's come back. Uh -huh. okay. The talk title is, it's all changed again, using continuous innovation to create great personal enterprise performance. I'll put that up just in case you're in the wrong venue and you want to go and look at the groovy thing. Is that going to work, Anthony? Uh, I'm going to talk about this big, brilliant skills framework we're putting in place and how it's going to work next year for you. And then, because I've you know, got your attention, as it were, I want to go through a few rules, I think, about um, personal innovation that I think are useful to understand. And, I'm going to refer to some books as well that I honestly think are great books on the subjects that are worth getting hold of as well. Is that all right? I don't think I'll take all of the 45 minutes to do all this, so you get a chance to ask me and others Q&A questions, I suspect, and also you get a chance to mingle a bit more, which is partly, I think, what the conference is all about, meeting people. And if you haven't met uh, Lola, who's sitting at the back there, say hello, Lola from PDI and Ruben High. So the first people I met on the subject of Agile a couple of years ago, you'll see I say this later, one of the rules is you're not on your own in this. And, uh, you know, thanks to them, I, when I was wandering around in the dark wondering what to do with Agile in this company, they came over and uh, started talking me through some things. So, uh, so certainly I would suggest if at the end of it you've got some questions, and they're really deep and difficult questions, Lola's here to answer those. <laughs> but, uh, is that all right? Shall we move? So I want to define what I mean by innovation, just for a few seconds. And there's two definitions, something new or different introduced, which is actually not what I'm really going to talk about today. And the other one is the act of innovating or introducing new methods. And really what I want to speak about is how we innovate ourselves, how we um, adapt, how we change. Because as I've said, we've no idea what our world is going to be like in 25 years' time. And therefore, it's not, as Charles Darwin once said, the strongest of the species that survive or the most intelligent. It's the ones most adaptive to change. And so what I want to talk about is some of those adaptive to change points, if that's okay. So it's really that one there. Innovating. Can I move like this, Anthony? Is that going to kill you? Fine. Very good. The act of innovating rather than anything else. Is that okay? So I want to talk a little bit about this big brilliant thing that we're doing. And then I'll move on to some rules that I want to introduce to you. So we've introduced this idea of... 
a certain amount of skills we think people need to have in the future in our company and we've introduced a progression, a way of, of getting better and better at them. And that consists of, first of all, there's a learn element to it, which is where you pick up skills. And that's wiki content that you read. Uh, I write it for a couple of the skills, other people will write it. Uh, we might even have a classic wiki idea where people can adjust it themselves and we can edit that adjustment and they can add other things as well. We're working on that, although the websites don't help. Uh, at the moment, we might change the websites. So online portal content written by, did like the phrase in-house expert, uh, for you to read. And then there'll be some self-assessment quizzes you can do. 25 questions, you answer them. Uh, so you can work out whether you've understood the content. Actually, you can probably do the self-assessment quiz without even looking at the content if you think you're up to it. That'd be fine as well. Uh, probably 25 questions, as long as you get... Now, more than three out of 25 questions wrong, you get a sort of a star to say, yes, you do know that area well enough, well done. And that's how it'll work. Uh, as many retakes as you like, it'll even tell you, you don't seem to be particularly good in this area, so why don't you go and read up on that first. It's really easy to do, a couple of hours maximum to do these sort of things. That'll be the learn track, and you get, I hope you love the idea of the stars. The stars that you collect on the learning record to say, yeah, you know this stuff now. And then there's the meet track, which is a follow-on track. You go from inexperienced to experienced, very experienced. And chances to meet experts, and that involves internal conferences, brown bag sessions, small deep dives. You're actually at a meet session today in how we put this together. This is what this is. There'll be four of these in the year. Um, there's probably going to be a, a scrum fest at O2 late May. We're going to take over O2 on a Saturday. So contractors and people can come half day. Uh, we're probably going to do some Scrum Master training for charities just beforehand, free of charge to charities. Um, across the Scrum Alliance, we're going to ask people to invite people to come to that training. So if you work for a big, uh, one of, I think, big charities or any of that sort of area, and you, and you want some Scrum Master training, we'll do that just before the event. I'm in conversation with Jeff Sutherland and um, Ken Schwaber to come uh, do some stuff with the board on the Friday and then talk on Saturday as well. Uh, there is a date set for that, it's late May. Anyway, there'll be three, three more of those conferences next year which you can come to and meet industry experts and in-house people working on it. And somehow, you will get some stars for attending. We haven't quite worked out how that's going to work, but you'll get some little... Uh, you get the idea of the McDonald's badge appearing in your head yet? Uh, then there's no chance to go on external courses, and if you think of the Agile track particularly that we've been running, that means you get to um, you know, put yourself forward for Scrum Master training, certified product owner training, stuff like that. There's some internal courses on that. Who's done Scrum Speedway in the UK? Yeah, thank you. If you haven't done Scrum Speedway, do get on it. It's very popular. 1,100 people so far. Um, about a third of them outside operations now, which is great news. It's a two-hour quick, fast introduction to Agile and things like that. You play Lego, you argue over how long it takes to peel a banana. It's great fun. Um, but there's also external qualifications. So you may be a Scrum Master certified by either the Scrum Alliance or Scrum.org in the UK. Uh, that's an external qualification you could get. Um, this, uh, this bit here is pay via your PDP, you know, and your personal development program, what you do. But actually, we have taken the initiative uh, and created in-house courses for those. So um, we've got 24 certified product owners now in, in a in the UK uh, operating division, and we've got about 35, 36, 35 Scrum Masters. And now, if you're internal, you can get a cross-charge on, on, your, on your sort of uh, operating cost codes and do these courses for about 480, 490, when on the open market, they're a grand. So I'm very pleased with that one. This is the new track we're putting in, Master. And the idea is, it's a bit like a PhD, it's all right doing the training, it's all right getting the qualification, but actually, you then want to go and use it, don't you? And so um, what we're, we're thinking of doing, and I'll be interested in what people think about this, is you submit something that's a couple of pages with some references. This is what I did my Scrum Master training. I did the training. I've used it on this particular project. I've used it to produce this benefit. You know, and that gives you this sort of master type classification. Uh, and um, there'll be a board who sort of look at the paper and go, yeah, that's great. I'm really looking forward to getting some Scrum Master Masters in the UK operating business next year who've proven benefit 202 of the training and the way they now work. 
So this idea of Learn, Meet, Know, Master, we put together for your digital futures as one of the eight tracks that you do. And uh, the board have decided we'll do the same idea for all the tracks next year. So um, as I say, I'm the curator for two of them now. I was just your digital futures. I'm now our DNA as well. And the other six tracks have curators. And um, most of this will all be really launched to the internal teams in uh, late January, February, when Derek does his um, town hall sessions and mentions there. It's all wiki content. Oh, yeah. I'm just curious, will this be applied to other areas and scrum training? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just using that one as an example. Okay. That's all right. So that's Learn Meet Now Master. Um, is that all right? So the categories, interestingly enough, are your digital futures, which is what this is, our DNA. Our DNA is really about behavior how we want to behave, and you'll see some of the stuff I talk about later is, I've already started to sort of get my head into that, you'll see. Uh, people management, managing the external supply arrangements, that's four of them. And the other four are service management, architecture, business consultancy, and program and project management. So they're all the tracks you've got next year. Is that all right? Do you have any questions on that before I move on? So can I just confirm, is this yeah. going across the whole of operations yeah. or the whole of the business? Operations. <coughs> operations, right. Operations, Nicola. However, um, we, we've had some discussions with Dan Bates about some initiatives he's got for people future for HR for the whole of the UK business. Right, okay. Um, because we're looking at technology deliverable solutions to this as well, we are talking to Group HR about right, okay. how it's done as well. Um, one of the things I've learned about Agile is you do minimum viable product, <laughs> get that in first and get it working. So hence, we did your digital futures this way around, being successful. We're going to spread that across the rest of the UK operating ones, and then we're going to see what we do with it next. At least I've got a couple of smiles with minimum viable product. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> oh, I feel like I want to tell you what minimum... Oh, I'll leave it. So having gone through, no, I will actually, minimum viable products are a really good concept that's starting to come out more and more yet. It is, instead of building a, a backlog, um, a list of all the things you possibly want to do with this product and then discuss for ages over what they might be, instead of that you go, what's the minimum you could get away with and put that out first? So if it was a car, you might have the push seats or the radio, but you would have the steering wheel because it's needed. And, and, and the, the interesting thing about minimum viable product isn't you then go on to do the stuff you were planning to do. What happens is you stop and find out what's working. And that might change a lot of what you do in minimum viable product. So uh, Steve Jobs, Apple, iPhone 2G comes out. He's asked at the conference, are they going to allow other developers to develop apps for it? He goes, why would we do that? We want to control this completely. They put a minimum viable product out of the 2G phone. All the feedback they got was actually, you need lots of apps. You look back now, in the app store and all the stuff that's there, billions of dollars of revenue for them, all came post their minimum viable product understanding of what the product would do. So the key to minimum viable product isn't what you might do later, it's stopping and working out what, what the customers want, really. So how do we do that in our project teams at the moment? Is that how, as in, do you think we do it, or how's it going? It's help. How do I do it tomorrow when I go back to my day job? Because you're doing, um, specifically, you're doing... So, I, so the, way, the way we work is we get a proposition from the, um, somebody in marketing that does all this customer insight stuff and then goes, I'm on, I'm on 14 things and then that's what I want. So we, as a project team now, we kind of look at all the requirements, we look at all the design, get the concept of minimum product, whatever. Minimum but, product. Um, how do we go from of information, 100% of information coming at us from marketing or product owner or, or business owner or whoever into actually let's, this is the minimum product so let's just work on that. How do we get to That's that That's a really point? good question. I think you should ask a little bit. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you. I think, I me, for, yeah, I'll give you my answer to that. Nicole. I think it's influence. I think it's, it's actually convincing the product owners. I, when we did this on a course, I said to everyone on the course, you should take this concept and convince people of the value of it, because I don't think, particularly where we've got initiative owners in marketing and places like that, they're convinced of the value of a minimum viable product. They think it's just a small release before the rest of it. 
And I think it's about sitting down with all the stakeholders and going, do you really get the point of a minimum viable product and why it's useful? It's not useful because you, it is useful because you get some return on investment. You do get the basic stuff out, but it's useful because before you then invest in the rest of it, you find out what will really bring return so, on investment. So I think the buy-in's there. I think my question is really how do we as delivery teams structure something into that minimal viable set to put on the table yeah. as a straw man to go, actually, you know, instead of taking nine months to develop 14 things, we could do these three and we can do it in two months and get it out there. To your point, yeah. and my question is, how do you get to these three? Three, okay. So you the yeah. that some of the, um, we've been doing some workshops which we've been calling inceptions, and they last anything between half a day to a week. I don't recommend the week ones unless you have to. <laughs> <laughs> I can only say wait for half a day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, um, but they've been quite useful because they, they take you very much back to the, what are you trying to achieve? Because you'll find that at least six of those 14 mm. things that people are asking for it's because I think it's a good idea and actually yeah. not in any way associated to what, they're, to what okay. they're trying to achieve. So you kind of take them back and they go, right, so that circle one, that would achieve our goals, then we'd make it better and that would achieve your goals, which, as you're saying, yeah. may end up never actually happening because they may have found it, found that it goes out there. And so, so do you run, do you run these workshops? Um, within online, I run oh, good. Can I have one? Yeah, yeah. 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 I'll have you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no problem. There's, a, there's, an industry, there's an industry thought leader in the UK called Roman Pitchler who we use mm. for product certified product owner training. Uh, I have consultancy sort of booked agreements with them as well. I can give you a couple of hours with him to talk about it as well. The idea we're using now with online delivery teams is we're saying to them, okay, this is your roadmap, really good. If you just had 50,000, what would you spend it on? And I need someone to come Forget that. In and just those just basic questions. tell me what that is. Yeah. Tell me what that is. Okay. Uh, we went to the board a while ago when we were doing the vision statements and what we wanted to do with Online at the Core, and we said they got 10 statements. We were in ha uh, Hansworth in London. And they got 10 statements. And I remember Brendan said to them, what's your priority in that? And they went, well, they're all number one. And then, uh, and this is what I love, he said, okay, they're all number one. Which ones would you do first? And then, oh, that one, that one, and that one. <laughs> and then one thing of the interest, you do the first ones, and then you, 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 you actually build something, share it to them every week, and then you say it's working, and it can be deployed. Then actually, it, I think it's difficult necessarily to persuade someone up front in workshops, but when you show them week in, week out, yeah. that you deliver this, there you go, it's working, you deliver them this, it's working. Yeah. And at some stage, after between being skeptical at the beginning to believing at the end, it's just a gradual process. You can't just necessarily persuade them, but you have to show that you can do it. So you have to have, I think it's a concept, isn't it? You say in the agile books, one agile practice is good, but all of them together is where you get the value. So you need the correct team, the continuous integration, the full test environment. Well, 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 I, think, as a whole. You, I think the journey's easy. I think it's getting yeah. to the start of the journey. So yeah. the you've used some words that I think are very interesting about Agile. You used belief. Yeah. For me, it is almost a religious conversion that happens to people. And I feel trying to convince them is not as easy as saying, hang on a minute, we'll show you some yeah. stuff. So when, when Brendan arrived and we were talking about how we delivered Agile and how we started to work on it, we instigated one principle above all others, show, not tell. For that reason, which is, you know, when people say, I don't think this will work, we say, you might be right, we're just going to go and find out. So are you listening? Yeah. Show, not tell. <laughs> Rewards, show, not tell. Yeah, question. So, not. So, so all the people that are going to give those responsibilities of front owner efforts, do they all follow the same training at the beginning? Um, so the, the first thing they'll get is some learn content, which is in there. Agile is in the learn content for your digital futures. There are five tracks. One of them is agile and delivery. Uh, another one is social trends. One is uh, online optimization. Another one is media. You know, the, the basic starter content is all in the learn category. The meat category is where you start to bring out some more specialization that's useful for people who have to practitioner in it. So the learn category is designed for anyone across operations to read and understand. So if I work as a tester uh, in Glasgow, I can read the content and start to get the concepts of what Agile, for example, might be. But then when you get into the meat category, that's when you start to get some real expertise starting to develop. Um, when you get to the no category, the no category is about your line manager agreeing it's part of your job to do these things and you really need them. And the master category is you're doing the job and what you want to show that benefit. Of. 
Does that you help? You've some stats, all the product owners out there that are currently doing product owner roles. You know which, where they are in. It needs to meet now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Although, the, if I'm honest with you, what's happened is we did our job, we worked out how, how it worked, we then articulated that in Learn, Meet, Now, Master, uh, and now we are bringing more into Learn, Meet, Now, Master. So certainly Agile, as one of the tracks has gone through this, we have lots of people who've got no masters at the front row there are Scrum Masters. We've got no one who's got master training or master certification yet because we're bringing it in in January. There's a couple of people in the room that I'm going to say, I'd like you to do this first for me. Yeah? And we'll use this idea across all the skills. The really interesting one for me is project management, and particularly this area of what no means and what certification means across product management. Thankfully, I'm not the curator for that. Do you see Scrum Masters and project management as separate disciplines? In they are in this uh, model, yes. Um, good question. Not the topic yeah. of today's no, conversations. No, it's really yeah. <laughs> Can I move on? So these are the categories I mentioned. So I want to actually now move on, if I can, to go through some experience and behaviour rules that I think are worth having. And I have used a bit of hyperbole here, so, you know, rule one, experience stops you from getting the future you hope for. Experience stops you getting the future you hope for. I've got a couple of examples. Any Man U fans in the room? I'm really sorry. <laughs> Man U one, Man City six. Do you remember it a couple of weeks ago? At the Manchester United ground. Let me say, Manchester United have had three out of the four last Champions League finals. They've come first or second in every Premiership um, league that has been. They are a phenomenal team. Man United won, Man City six. First time Man City has scored six in a derby since 1926. Equals the biggest ever margin of victory in a derby that Man City have ever had. Equals their biggest ever league tally in a Premiership match. The heaviest defeat in Premier League history for Man United. Worst defeat at Old Trafford since 1955. First time they've conceded six at home since 1930. It's a stunning, stunning result. What happened? Do you know what happened? Darren Fletcher scored a goal at 1-3 at the start of the second half. And if you're at Man U and you're at home, your experience tells you one thing. You always score the goals to get to at least equal, if not better. There's a joke that goes, how long do you have a, a extra time at Manu? And it is until Manu score. Yeah? Their whole experience told them, and they've had that for all their entire football in life, at this point when we're down at home, what we do is push forward and score more goals. And so they did exactly what their experience told them to do. They pushed forward to try and score more goals. And Man City are entirely tuned around a counter-attack defence. And that's why that happened. In other words, their experience stopped them understanding what to do. Alex Ferguson said we were at times suicidal. Experience stops you from getting the future you have for. What, what experience do you have in the room that is actually part of your job now that's actually going to stop you adapting to this new digital future where the computers we have now can be the size of a blood cell in 20 years? Who knows what that is? The Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> you say a say a ship, Jared. I'm really pleased Jared's in my team. <laughs> Did you read the Titanic? It is the Titanic. 15th of April, 1912, that sunk in an iceberg field, killing 1,751 people. Yeah? It was an unsinkable ship. Captain Smith, steam full speed ahead into an iceberg field. Why? Because he was very experienced and it had never stopped him being successful before. If you watch the film Titanic, there's a line in there where one of the characters says his experience got in, got in the way of him understanding what would work. Lots of people said since, a less experienced, they put their most experienced captain on that because of the flagship journey. He wanted to get into New York by Monday morning. They put the most experienced captain they got on it. A far less experienced captain would have slowed down. So, if experience isn't the key, what is the key? I think it's a mixture of experience, attitude, and behaviour. Later on today, uh, the keynote late in the afternoon is on Neo for J. Looks very good, graphical interface, love it. A classic PM approach to that would be find me someone who's got five years' experience on it. 
and they just don't exist. So I think more and more attitude and behaviour are going to be the keys to recruitment and certainly when we're recruiting BAs now I'm looking, you, you can't get a BA with good agile experience and good business understanding who's, in, who's influenced the business who's been doing it for five years, you just don't get around. So what we're looking for now is people who've got the right attitude and the right behaviour because we'll support the experience and the learning. Yeah. Is this all right? Now, please bear in mind, I use a little bit of hyperbole when I try and make these points. It's my natural style. That doesn't mean, you know, you've got no experience at all, you can apply to be the CEO tomorrow. Just bear in mind I'm not saying that. <laughs> Have I let you down? Sorry. <laughs> Is that okay? Is this making sense? Any questions? Okay, move on. Oh, yes, a book. I said most of these points. There's only four rules. I'll mention a book. Escape Velocity. Free Your Company's Future from the Pull of the Past by Jeffrey A. Moore is a fantastic book on this. It's actually about corporate cultures and how you ring fence your past and invest in your future for a corporate culture. But actually, I think many of the points in there can apply on personal development and innovation for you. Um, you can get videos of this guy doing talks on this at Stanford. Uh, if you've got an app and you download eCorner is the name of the app you can get. Uh, you get the video on your phone as well, listen to He's a phenomenal guy. Um, Phil Jordan introduced Brendan to, him, to his work. Brendan introduced most of his key team to that work as well. Really good. As I say, actually, a little bit of this, there's a key here to all the types of innovation, which is he's talking about corporate cultures, but you can apply it to personal development. And it made me think, what bits of, do I, what bits of my uh, work life am I so comfortable with, I love doing, but actually aren't successful? And how can I get into some of the uncomfortable stuff that might be more fruitful to the company and a little bit of risk for me, but worth doing. And you'll see there's another bit later where I talk about no fear for the same reason. It's always worth taking risks, I think. Is that all right? So that's my first one, rule one. Rule two, create a space for innovation in your life. Um, I'm sort of talking about space within your life, but also within your head. Uh, I love the next picture I'm about to show you, I use it all the time. Someone commented, the reason I use this picture all the time about the rush of life and everything that comes in is because I can't possibly do that. And that is a fair point. <laughs> probably why I like it so much. I thought about this and uh, if you've done Scrum Speedway, someone asked me, why is Scrum Speedway made up of Lego and fruit? And actually, it's interesting, I just finished uh, some meetings, actually, uh, Lola was involved in those. And I was on a train going north, and I got four hours, and uh, I couldn't ring anyone, and I couldn't do emails. And I got, uh, I'm sitting on the train, and I just had had a call from my son, asking if he would buy some Lego. He'd, um, he wanted to do his own designs, and he'd made them in 3D, and then you could send off for this particular package and get it. And I remember sitting on the train and I got some fruit, I got a banana and I got an apple and I got an orange and I sat there. And I got some constraints, which was I wanted to create something that was a couple of hours of usefulness, but I didn't want to duplicate the stuff that Lola and her team and, and others were doing because, you know, that was there. I didn't want to use any of their exercises. I got some constraints, which always help with innovation. And I've got space because I was on a train. And uh, I can't quite remember how it all happened, but I sort of got off the train thinking, Lego game, argue over fruit. And we, we changed it and changed it a little bit. But actually, um, if I look back, the thing that made that happen was the fact I was on a train and couldn't do calls and couldn't do emails, actually. I was sort of stuck with a problem. I thought, well, I'll, I'll think about that for a bit, you know. Create personal space. But actually, I also mean creating personal space in your head. Most of the really interesting stuff on how the brain works has really only come out in the last 10, 15 years. Certainly wasn't around when I was at uni. You know, they put all sorts of people in a scanner and work out what happens in their heads. Phenomenal program on super brains a while ago on Radio uh, BBC uh, 4, the power of super brains. They put a guy who loved Apple, who'd been to 51 of the Apple store launches around the world, into a brain scanner and showed him pictures of Apple devices and Motorola devices. And you know the bit of his head that lit up? is exactly the same bit that lights up when a Catholic is put in there and they show a picture of Jesus. They worship. This guy definitely was an apple head who worshipped. 
uh, just a slight distraction. The point is, most of what we've learned about the brain we've learned in the last 10, 15 years. And one of the things we've learned is this, that this area here at the front here, which is called the prefrontal cortex, where you do all your thinking, and I, uh, I think, therefore, I am, and your basal ganglia, which are in here, and do all your sort of background thinking, like uh, remember to breathe. Yeah? The prefrontal cortex is far more modern and takes a lot more energy. And what lots of people do with that prefrontal cortex is they use it for storage. So we're all in IT. I can talk about an analogy from computers, can't I? You've got the RAM on the computer disk that you should use for quick stuff and decisions. And then you've got the hard disk where you keep all your storage. And what a lot of people do is use this, what is their RAM disk, the front bit, to store things. You've only got so much of this RAM disk in your head. And if you use all of it for storing things, you've got no, no space left in there for thinking. So you need to create the space for thinking and innovation and change by taking all the stuff you keep stored in this prefrontal cortex bit and putting it somewhere else. There's a famous quote in one of the books on personal development that says, you know when your brain reminds you you need to mow the lawn is when you're at the airport. Because it's, it's stored up here, I must mow the lawn. But your brain has no understanding of diary and when it might come out and when it might not come out. So you waste all this fantastic thinking power to just store information. So another book on this, um, David Allen's book, Getting Things Done, says, how near is your pen and paper? Because it's too far away. I have that on me. Yes, I have. Good. I keep a little, any idea I have, I put it on there. It's not very, uh, for a guy who loves gadgets, it's not very gadget friendly, is it? And I also, forgive me, I've got loads of other things in my pocket at the moment, but I also keep a, a small pen in my pocket at all times. So I am a bit obsessive, you know. But, on the other hand, I try not to keep things in my head. Because it's far too valuable. Yeah? So create the space is about creating some space as well in your diaries. I remember a conference where one of our leaders said, you know, you should always have two or three hours a week in your diary free to do nothing. And I was in the audience, 900 people there all laughed. You know? We don't make our lives easy, but we do have to create this space in order for us to innovate and change. Space in uh, physical environments, but also space in our head for it to do. Is that all right? Is that something that um, folks are looking at potentially within... Well, brain scans. Yeah, brain scans as well. <laughs> but, um, you know, the sort of Google concept of 20% of your time to do something innovative, not project-related or... Uh, I think that's, that's, we're pushing on that concept. I think it's a bit of a dangerous concept for people who haven't yet got it. Yeah. Um, but we are doing some of those ideas. Who's in the code club? Yeah. You know, uh, we were talking to our online team about, you know, uh, the online delivery team, yeah. that's what people are at, and this idea of, I said, we said, I said, is this all right? And we went, oh, here's an idea. If you've got 50K, what would you spend it on? And you went, oh, I might do this and this. And we went, why don't we take those to the code club and ask them what they do with them? Actually, why don't you come and listen to what the code club is saying? Codes are geeky developers who sit there and, you know, think, why don't we try this out? It might not be useful, but who cares? We're, lo we're loving doing it. Yeah? Although I think the code club meets afterward, doesn't it? See. Uh, we did have this thing at the conference saying, you know, 20% of your time not on diary stuff. You know, I think we're a big corporate culture, that yeah. might be hard. But there's nothing to say 20% of your time yeah. can't be spent doing that as a personal commitment to yourself. Hey, yeah. we're in New Year, resolutions appear. Yeah. Why don't you give yourself a resolution? <laughs> Sorry about this. The book. I would recommend the book. Your Brain at Work. Strategies for Overcoming Distraction, Regaining Focus and Working Smart All Day Long by David Rook. What was the previous book you mentioned? Um, escape Velocity. Um, well, escaping the... Once not on the slides, that's one you mentioned. Yeah. Two or ago. Uh, Getting Things Done by David Allen. Very viral book, particularly in IT and things like that. Getting Things Done. He's written three. Getting Things Done, Making It All Work and... 50 some things that you can use to change your life forever. That sort of title. Um, I met Jeff Sutherland, who's one of the fathers of all this agile and scrum stuff. We had a coffee in Oxford. He personally recommended that book as the best book he'd ever read. And I thought, well, if Jeff Sutherland recommends that book, I should get it. And David Rock, you can get that talk or large parts of it on YouTube as well if you want. And he talks all about this 
prefrontal cortex. And he's got a, a lovely model for how this is like a small theatre with lots of lights on it all the time, therefore requires energy, and can only have four or five actors on it. And underneath it, which is where the basal ganglia is, is a large theatre that doesn't require many lights. It can have thousands of actors on it. And the job we have is to move stuff out of the small theatre that requires lots of energy to the large theatre that doesn't require any energy. So when you learn to drive, you take up an awful lot of your prefrontal cortex to learn. But once you've learned, it's all in your basal ganglia. And you don't think about when you change gears, do you? Yeah? You know how you change gear in England if you've got a clutch? You put your foot down on the clutch and then you change. And once I was given an automatic car without a clutch. There's four of us in the car. We were coming out of Eastleigh. And something happened. I think it was the first time I was ever in a car where the brakes went on. You know, oh, the door was locked as I did five miles an hour. I was so surprised, I decided to brake. And if, if it had been the sort of car with a gear stick, I would, have, I would have slammed my foot down to take the gear out and then gently braked. Instead, what I did, because my basal ganglia took over, was I slammed the brake on and hit the accelerator really hard. And all four <laughs> people in the car lurched forward and banged their heads. Uh, there's a, if there's a single book I'd say read, it's that book actually. Really. Your brain at work. Rule three. The only habit of highly effective people. Who's heard of the seven habits of highly effective people? Yeah, yeah. Actually, there's a lot now on the internet, and I'd agree with this, that says there's only one habit in there that's really, really, really useful, and that's be proactive about what you do and say. I won't go on about it because I've got time. But I would say that's a really good rule, is getting proactive about things. And certainly the thing I'm observing and measuring in people and lots of stuff that we're doing now in the digital area and a lot of you guys is how proactive we are. Sometimes to the point where people are going, I wish you weren't quite so proactive. But I'd, I'd rather we heard on the side of annoying people with our proactivity. Yeah? Uh, rule four, you're not alone. I, if there's anything I feel on the subject of the future is, you know, not do it on your own. I had a conversation only a few minutes ago with someone who said, how's it going on online at the court? It is relentless, isn't it? Uh, and it is relentless. It is hard work. And doing it on your own, you're never going to succeed. But doing it with others. Since Lola is here, I will say, when I was wandering around what to do with Agile originally, some thoughts that uh, Ruben and Lola and Gemma had, and I realised I was part of a community of people who were trying to change. That made a big difference to me. So, um, yeah, we're going to finish soon. It's called Scrum for a reason, you know, in case you don't know. Again, I asked Jeff Sutherland about why Scrum is called Scrum. He says it's based on a paper from Nanuki and Nanaka, Japanese people who did a review in Harvard Business Review. And they said, we know that the best performing teams follow the pattern of rugby rather than football. In football, the ball is passed to team member one by one. Each person does the job while the other stands still or run around. In rugby, we know that the ball is moved around by a team together. And it's a much better way of working. You get an awful lot of principles out of team. And, and because they were Japanese and they didn't quite understand it, they, they took scrum as the name. What they ought to have called it is mauling, which is what the actual rugby term is, but more speed where it doesn't make as much sense, does it? <laughs> But at the heart of Scrum, at the heart of Agile, is you're not alone as part of a team. Um, you've all seen the picture of the, I nearly put one on, the picture of this sort of Roman shields thing where we did a demo, we went to a live demo of this a while ago, and there were a bunch of about 15 p people pretend to be Roman soldiers. Has anyone here ever heard of John Quick? He used to work at our company. He, he, does, he does 19th Indiana. He runs around the countries at weekends shooting Confederates with guns. Huge events they are. Anyway, one of those events, I went to see John, was a bunch of Roman soldiers. And they did this thing where they moved into this turtle, they call it, where they have shields all around them and shields above, and you just can't get in. I think there's a bit of that about how we need to move forward as well, together in teams. It is very interesting that there's some, there's some tension between personal performance and team performance, isn't there, in some of these new ways of working. And actually, if everyone is personally 100% full, sometimes the team aren't as effective as they could be. I could put a slide up that talks about this, which shows a picture of, um, it's from San Francisco, of a freeway being completely closed. And we think the right thing to do when we've got 90% busy lives is force 10% more stuff in. That's just the equivalent of gridlock, really. 
what we actually have to do is take stuff out so there's free space for things to move around a bit more. Um, better the devil you know. When change happens, it gets very hard. And one of the things that happens is people revert to what they know, not what might work instead. And lots of people go back to you know, the devil they know rather than trying out these new innovative techniques. The devil we know will not get us to the future. Is that okay? It is funny, though, that when I talked to PMs, particularly last year, about Agile and these sort of things, and I asked them what happens when a project really goes off the rails and what they do about it, they go, well, basically, we get everyone together, and then we work out exactly what we should do, and then we do it for a few weeks. And it's really interesting that when the poo really is the fan, they, they go straight to some principles that they know are true, but they don't always operate normally. And then on this slide I've got no fear because, you know, I think a lot of the decisions we make are to protect ourselves from failure, not to risk success. And I've got why because I think um, I would always say, getting back to why we're doing something lets us understand a lot better. We, I'll rephrase that. A lot of the time we spend, we, we do things because we do them all the time, because that's how our diary works, that's what we have. But actually, if we went back to why we do things, I think we might clear a few things out. I certainly, in January, when I look at my diary and go, why do I do that one-hour meeting every week? I think I'm nearly finished. Oh, the book on this. Uh, it's not really a book, actually. It's a Harvard Business Review paper, but you can get it in all the Harvard Business Review summary papers. The Making of an Expert, interestingly enough, and it talks about an expert being very diligent about practice. That's one of the key things that comes out of it. And also, having a coach. These people did an awful lot of surveys of how people became very successful. And one of, the, one of the key things I learned was really successful people always have a coach, always have someone who is coaching them and helping them. So who, who's taken advantage of our coaching services in the... Good, I don't know good, good, yeah, I think, you know, get a coach. Um, I'm going to do some coaching next year. I haven't done, I haven't done any deliberately this year. I'm doing some coaching next year, so you know, I haven't got that much time, but I'm available if you want some coaching. The Making of an Expert. And there's a few books that have, since that paper, brought that point out. Possibly the one I'd really recommend is called 18 Minutes uh, by... Give me a second, I'll look it up on my Kindle. Which I'm currently reading, 18 Minutes by Peter Bregman. And really, he's taken, you know, like there's this trend for popular science, which takes proper science and makes it a bit easier to understand. Peter Bregman has really done that with the making of an expert and turned it into something called 18 Minutes. I think we're done. I want to finish with this. How do users see the programmers? Who's seen this before? How do programmers see the users? Because I want to make one final point, it's this. If next year when you've got these tracks, all you do is pick up your digital future, which you're the best at anyway, well done, you'll get some stars. If instead, for example, you pick up the service management track and do all the learning in that, that might give you a different viewpoint on things. And with a different viewpoint might come a change in how you view things, which will change how you do your job. So my core for action is simply this. Next year, in your New Year resolutions, will you please make a resolution to get into the Learn, Meet, Now tracks and be brilliant, use them because they're, they're written for your advantage to get personal productivity and skill sets out. Um, try and, if you're up for it, try and get one of those master certifications. I'd love us to get to 15, 20 people next year with that. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got two minutes for questions if you want.